Welcome to Sagebrush. Today we're continuing our series, Bright and Gloom. To follow along, be sure to download and open up the Sagebrush app and click on the message notes. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube for weekly content updates. Thanks for being a part of the Sagebrush family. We're so happy you're here. Right now, let's start our time together with some worship. Welcome, everybody. We're so glad you're with us. Right now, I want you to stand on up to your feet. We're going to spend some time worshiping our great God together. He's worthy of our voices. He's worthy of all we got. Also, we have some friends that are getting baptized today. So let's celebrate with them as we spend some time singing together. Come on now. to praise, I will give thanks, I will give thanks, when the Lord that I hear is the voice of my feet, trying to silence this hope in my heart, I will give thanks, I will give thanks, the song of thanksgiving is my
grace that's mine today that Jesus Christ has won so I can face tomorrow for tomorrow's in your hands and all I
Days may be darkest, but your light is greater. You light our way, God, you light our way. When evil is rising, you're rising higher with power to save, with power to save. You keep hope alive. You keep hope alive from the beginning to end. Your word never fails. You keep hope alive because you are alive. Jesus, you are alive.
even when we don't understand everything. I know I've wasted so much time worrying and doubting, forgetting that you have a plan for us, for each of us. Thank you so much for your faithfulness that you always make a way. God, you never change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we love you, and we pray this in your name, amen. Thank you so much for singing with us. You can have a seat. Well, today we want to honor a very special person. Whether you're a biological mom, an adoptive mom, a foster mom, whether you play a motherly role in someone's life, today we want to honor you. So right now, would you stand on up? Come on, let's see for all the moms. Let's give them a big round of applause, you guys. 
Thank you for your patience, for your wisdom, for your support. Thank you for always being there for us. Right now you can have a seat and let's listen to this song all about mamas. Well, I want to welcome everybody here today in the room, those watching us at home and on the stream. Also want to welcome those on TV and those on our multi-site campuses all around New Mexico and in Belize. We're glad that you're a part of our service today. Let me start off by telling you a little story. A state trooper pulls over a gentleman and his wife. He's going 85 miles an hour. And uh, so the state trooper comes, the guy rolls the window down, he has his driver's license registration. He says, sir, do you know why I pulled you over? And the man says, I got no idea at all. He said, well, I pulled you over for going 85 mile an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone. And the man said, well, that's impossible. I am a law-abiding citizen. I never speed. With that, the trooper leaned over, looked at the wife and said, ma'am, is that true? She said, no, he's the worst driver I've ever seen. It's pedal to the metal all the time. He scares me to death. So the officer began to write him a ticket. He said, I also noticed that you didn't have your seat belt on. That's against the law as well. Is that true? And the man said, no, sir, I use every life-saving measure I possibly can that the car affords me. That is possible. That is impossible. I would never do such a thing. Trooper leaned down, looked at the wife, said, is that true, ma'am? She said, no, he never wears his seat belt. Probably got cobwebs on that crazy seat belt. 
Well, the man is livid at this point. He turns to his wife and says, well, what in the world are you trying to do to me? He begins to call her a couple names. Officer says, ma'am, does he always talk to you that way? She said, no, only when he's drunk. <laughs> I waited all week for that one joke right there, friends. That's good stuff. Nothing like the love of a good Woman. Well, today we're going to continue our series called Bride and Gloom, and we're going to shift gears just a little bit. Rather than talking about marriage, we're going to shift to parenting, and then next week we're going to shift back to marriage. We're going to talk about how to affair proof your married relationship, so make sure that you come back for that. Now, before we shift into parenting, I want to do all the ladies here a solid, all right? I want to do all the gals here a solid, all the married wives and all the gals who are dating somebody. Here's what I want to talk to the guys about for just a second. Gentlemen, your job is to be romantic. And being romantic means that you take your wife or you take your date on an actual date. Now, you know how this goes, right? When you're dating for a few months, all of a sudden you get lazy and you're not really whining and dining the person, taking them to new places, doing new things, making new adventures. Same way with marriage, isn't it? We, we get into a rut where we never ask our wife out on a date. We never get a babysitter, and we just kind of drift. And weeks can go by, months can go by without taking your wife out on a date. So here's your homework assignment, men, if you choose to accept it. I want you to take your wife or your girlfriend out on a date. And ladies, I want you to say yes when he asks you to go out on that date. Don't shoot him down. Don't break his confidence at that point, all right? Now, some of the guys are sitting here right now, and they're going, Todd, you're right. I need to do that more often than I do it. I've kind of gotten lazy in that. But to be honest with you, Todd, I don't know what I would do. I don't know where I would go. I don't know what I would say. I mean, I, I want to date her, but I don't know what to do with her, to be honest with you. Well, I'm going to help a brother out today, all right? We have made up a bride and gloom card pack full of 15 dates, all right? This is going to be so easy for you guys. On the way, when you walk out, you grab a pack. If you're a couple, grab one pack. If you're a single person, you grab a pack. And here's what I want you to do, men. I want you to go home. I want you to lay out the cards for your wife. And ladies, you pick a card. And there's no take backs, okay? There's no take backs. Whatever you get is what you actually have to follow through and you have to do, okay? And, and, and you say, okay, Todd, well, I'll do that. I'll take her out on a date. But what, 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 what are we going to talk about? Because I don't know what to say to her. Do I have to talk to her while we're on the day? Man, you need help, brother, I tell you what. Well, here's the great news about these cards. There's conversation starters on the cards as well. So that means, ladies, he won't look at you like, duh. Because you can ask a question, and the two of you can just have good conversation. Isn't that good? So make sure you take advantage of of this. Now, gentlemen, one more thing I'm giving you as your homework assignment. When you take her out on the date, I want you to hold her hand. Okay, I want you to hold her hand. I know that sounds weird that I'm even asking you to touch your wife, but that's what I'm asking you to do. Because a lot of you guys, you don't touch your wife unless something, something's involved. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay, I'll touch her hand, but does that mean something, something's going to happen later on? I don't know. Something, something's going to happen later. But touch her hand. Hold her hand. Put your arm around her. Show her your moves, gentlemen, all right? Another thing you can do to spice up your marriage, just write little love notes to each other. Just get those little three-by-five little cards, you know, those little post-it notes. And just write those. Put those up all over the place. That's the problem with most marriages today. There's no spice. There's no spontaneity. There's no fun. There's, there's no dating. This is supposed to be an adventure that you go on together where you love each other and you care for each other and you forgive each other and you have fun with one another, okay? So I hope that you'll do that. All right, now, it's the simple things, isn't it, that make relationships great. And it's the same way in our parenting relationships with our kids. It's the smallest things. It's the simplest things that make the biggest difference. So I'm going to share with you three unforgettable phrases that every parent needs to say to their child over and over and over again. Now, these, these three phrases, they work for any relationship. So whether you have children or not, you can just take these and you can put them in any relationship that you want to, and it will enhance that relationship, okay? Now, one thing I want to say before I get into the phrases, this is to all the parents. You understand, don't you, that your words have more weight on your child than anybody else? 
I mean, your kids can be praised by all their friends and say they're awesome and add a boy and all that good stuff, and that's a good thing. But when you say something to them, it holds more weight and more power than the words of anybody else. And the Bible says, parents, that our words have the power of life and death. So one of the things you're going to be thinking about during this message, am I bringing words that bring life or am I bringing words that bring death? Three phrases that your kids need to hear over and over and over again. You probably already know the first phrase. It's, I love you. Your kids need to hear, I love you, over and over and over again. I remember it was years ago when my youngest daughter, Cammie, was about 10 years old. She came to me one afternoon. I could tell that something was wrong, had been wrong off a little bit for the last couple of days. So she came to me and she said, do you love me no matter what? Now, I, I, was, I was taken back by that question because I thought, what in the world has happened here that would cause my daughter to question my love for her? So I sat her down and I said, Cammy, I want you to know that you can count on my love no matter what. It, it, my love for you is not based upon your performance. My love for you is not based upon your achievements. There's nothing you can do today, Cammy, that would cause me to love you a little bit more. And there's nothing you can do today that would cause me to love you a little bit less. I love you with a never-ending, unconditional love. Do you understand what I'm saying? A never-ending, unconditional love. And as I was telling her this, I could just see her just kind of relax a little bit, like she'd been carrying this heavy burden. I said, do you understand the words coming out of my mouth? She said, yes, Dad. Thank you for telling me that you love me no matter what. And then you know what she said next? She began to tell me all the sins that she had committed for the last couple of weeks. And I thought, you little sinner, you set me up, didn't you? That's what you did right there. I said, Cammie, I appreciate you sharing that with me. And I want you to know that you can count on my love. You can also count on my discipline. I'll tell you that right now, too. Your children need to know that you love them with an unconditional, irrational love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is the kind of love, parents, that we're supposed to be shooting for. The Bible says that love is patient, that love is kind, that doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not proud. Love is not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects always trust, always hopes, it always perseveres. Love never fails. And here's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to grade ourselves on how loving are we. Friends, if the people that you have in your sphere of influence, if they don't look at you and they say, that's the person who loves me greater than anybody else, you have failed them. You have failed them in that relationship. Jesus said, you'll know that you're my disciples by the way that you love one another. So let's look at it from the parent-child relationship. Let's just grade ourselves a little bit. Parents, are you patient with your children? Do you find your fuse is getting shorter? Do you find yourself getting angry easier over the things that you used to not get angry over? Love is patient. How about this one? Are you kind? Love shows in kindness, doesn't it? Are you kind with your words? Or are you always berating them? Always putting them down, always saying terrible things to them, even calling them names. That's not being loving. The Bible says that love keeps no record of wrongs. Are you throwing their past in their face? Are you reminding them over and over again of what they've done wrong in the past just so your words have a little more sting to them? Are you forgiving in the same way that Jesus has forgiven you? And are you casting that sin as far as the east is from the west and remembering that sin no more? Because if you are, then you're being loving. And if you're bringing it back up and shoving it in their face, then you're not being loving. Is your love enduring? Does your love have perseverance? Do your children know that you love them no matter what? Because the Bible says that love always perseveres, that love never fails. One of the things that I've realized being a parent of three girls is that my kids leak. They leak. I, I can tell them I love them. I can tell them I love them again and again and again and again and again. And they leak. They need to hear it over and over and over again. This is your child. This is your words. Look at this. It's the craziest thing. You pour into them all these words of affirmation. And it just goes in one ear and out the other ear, doesn't it? 
and you tell them, oh, I love you so very much, nothing can change the fact that I love you. My love for you is not based upon your performance. It's not based upon your achievements. It's not based upon anything you do. And it just goes in one ear and out the other ear. And you think, are they ever going to get it? Are they ever going to understand how much I love them? And the answer is no, they're never going to get it. Because it just keeps coming out of them. We tell our kids daily, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times a day, I love you. I love you. I am for you. Why do I tell it to them over and over and over again? Because the world that we live in is hard and it's harsh. And the kind of love that they see in so many people is a love that is based upon their performance or their achievements. It's a love that's conditional upon whether or not they're being loving back. They need somebody in their life that will show them an unconditional love. They've got to see the love of God. Isn't that how he loves you? Isn't that how he loves me? He comes right out and is the vulnerable one. He says, I love you. He loved you so much that he became flesh and dwelt among us. My goodness, God loves you so much. He knows the number of hairs on your head. His thoughts of you outnumber the grains of sand on the seashore. He loves you so much that every tear you've ever shed, he's collected every single one of those tears. That's how much God loves you. And then he shows the full extent of his love by coming, living a perfect, sinless life. Dying on the cross. You want to know how much he loves you? Look at the outstretched arms of Jesus. Look at his nail stretched hands. He says, this is how much I love you. You got to tell your kids. You got to tell them again and again and again and again. In a world where there breeds insecurity, you have to bring security to their life. That's the first phrase that you got to get down is I love you. The second phrase is this, I believe in you. I believe in you. Another way to say it is I'm proud of you. When my three daughters were young, they would put on shows. Do we have any other parents whose kids put on shows? Just put your hands up so I don't feel alone. Just let me know. All right, there's a bunch of you. That's so good to know. I thought my kids were weird. Okay, thank you for that. I never understood the show thing. It's like they would go back in their bedroom for hours at a time, and then they'd say, well, we're going to put on a show, and we'd have to sit there for the next two, three hours and watch them come out and have outfits and designs and, and songs and all kinds of stuff. It was crazy, I tell you what. And and they did these shows for years and years and years. It was was an absolute blast. I mean, we laughed and laughed and laughed. They were the dumbest things I've ever seen in my life. But we laughed and laughed and laughed. When American Idol came out years ago, when it was at the peak of its popularity, we would sit there as a family. We'd watch it. Then afterwards, my kids would say, well, we want to be on American Idol. And I'd say, all right, we'll stand on the fireplace. We'll give you a microphone. We had a fake little microphone. And you pick a song, and you sing the song. And then mom will be Paula Abdul, and I'll be Simon Cowell, all right? And we'll we'll figure out who's going to make it to Hollywood or not. And we would play that game night after night, just having the time of our life. I kind of want to show you what a show from the Cook household was like. And we have lots of videos of these different shows, but my kids have never let me do it. One of the rules I have as being your preacher is I always ask my wife if it's okay if I can share an illustration, and I always ask my kids if it's okay if I can share it. And for the most part, they're really good about it. But when it comes to the shows, they're like, no, we don't want you to show that to anybody else. We don't want you, anyone else to see that. And I'm not kidding you, for the last two or three years, I've been begging them, can I show this one show? It's a show that my middle daughter Hannah did and my youngest daughter Cammie did. It is drop dead in my mind, hilarious. It's a little bit embarrassing for them. And so I said, would you please let me show this show? They said, no, no, no. We will never let you show that show. Well, this last week, I, I, I guilted them to a level I've never guilted them before. And they have given me permission to show you a show. I'm so excited. Hannah and Cammie, take it away. Keep it like- 
what in the world? I wonder where they got that from. That's the craziest thing that you see right there. And then Hannah starts headbanging. That's my favorite part at the very end. It's like, this is not a headbanging song, Hannah. I don't know what to tell you about that. Why do our kids put on show after show after show after show? They want to know that we believe in them, that we think what they do is absolutely awesome. Your children, my children, live up to the belief that we instill inside of them. Did you know that? And they will soar, and they will go after dreams if you'll tell them you believe in them, if you tell them that you see things in them that nobody else sees. Now, no doubt, my kids have zero talent. I understand that. But man, to build them up, to encourage them, to say God's got a plan and a purpose for your life that's greater than singing, obviously. You'll find your niche at some point in time. (laughs) It makes all of the difference in the world. How many times do you hear your child say, I'm no good? I can't do anything right. Nobody cares about me. I'm just a screw up. I'm always going to disappoint you. Have you ever heard your kids say those kinds of things? Listen, you pull them aside and you grab them and you say, look in my eyes. You are a child of God. You're a child of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life. And you're good at a lot of things. And God's going to use you. To do great things. There was a kid. He came home from school. He was all upset. He said, Dad, everybody hates me. Dad said, that's not true. Everybody hasn't met you yet. (laughs) I don't think that came out the way he wanted it to, to be honest with you. I love this quote from Pablo Picasso. His mother just had an unbelievable belief in him. And she would tell him over and over again, if you were a soldier, you'd be a general. If you were a monk, you'd end up being the Pope. This is what he said. He said, instead, I became a painter and wound up as Picasso. Isn't that good? In the book, Raising Cain, the author shares a story about a a dad named Raul who took his son out on a skiing trip. And I guess this skiing trip didn't turn out the way the dad thought it was going to because his kid couldn't ski for spit. I mean, he fell down all over the place. He never even really got on his skis. He fell down for more times and he moved down the roadway. He, he never even got out of the bunny slopes, to be honest with you. And all day long, the dad's encouraging him. All day long, the dad's saying, you can do it, man. I believe in you. I'm proud of you. You're giving another shot. Oh, I'm so proud of you. You haven't given up. Way to go, son. Way to go. Well, they got to the end of the day, and the kid wasn't any better skiing than he was when he first put the skis on at the beginning of the day. But they laughed, and they thought everything was funny, and they got to the car. They'd drive home. The dad said, what was your favorite part of today? And the little boy said, watching you watch me ski. He didn't care if he could ski or not. He just wanted to be with his dad. He wanted to hear the belief that his dad had in him. He wanted to hear how proud his dad was of him. Those words... Oh, man, your words have such weight. They meant everything to him. Dave Stone's a preacher, and he was leading a small group for high school kids. And um, his wife and his kids came in. He stopped the small group. He introduced his wife to the group, and then he started to introduce his kids. And one by one, he brought his young children in front of the group, and he began to say, well, this is my oldest son. And he shared his name. He said, this is what his name means. And then he went past the superficial, and he talked about the character of this particular child. And how tender-hearted he was and how kind he was. And he just went on and on, one child after another child after another child, just blessing those children, just sharing how his great love and what he sees in them. He said what shocked him was how visibly shaken the high school kids were in the room when he was doing this. And he said it wasn't just the girls, it was the guys too. And Dave stopped what he was doing and he said, don't your parents talk to you like this? And they all shook their heads no. And then he asked this question. He said, would you like them to? And every single child said yes. You can't say it enough. I believe in you. I'm proud of you. Now, now, now who is our example in all of this? Well, it's God the Father. Look at this. When Jesus is getting baptized... When he comes out of the water, God can't hold back anymore. He's so excited 
that he just bursts forth and there's a voice that comes down from the heavens. And what's the voice say? Matthew 3, 17. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now I want you to get this. Jesus hasn't done anything of any significance up to this point. He is just beginning his public ministry. But God was claiming Jesus as his own. Because of his sonship, God loved him and was proud of him. So what do we want to say over and over again? I love you, I love you, I love you, I believe in you, I believe in you. I'm so very, very proud of you over and over and over again. It builds your children up. Let me give you the third unforgettable phrase. I prayed for you today. I prayed for you today. When's the last time you uttered those words to your child? I prayed for your situation. I prayed for that stress. I prayed for your anxiety. I prayed for what you're facing. I prayed for this circumstance. I prayed for you today. Parents, listen to me. Greatest gift you can give your child is to pursue the Lord your God with every fiber of your being. To be steadfast. To show them what it means to be a real deal follower of Jesus Christ. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and with all your strength. There's nothing more powerful in the life of a child than to see a mom or a dad reading the Bible. Or on their knees praying. Or seeking the face of God when they have a big decision to make. There's nothing more powerful when church is the priority of the weekend. And them being in whatever class that we offer here is the priority that they would be in there. And then you would discuss those things and talk about those things and apply those things to your life. Listen, a lot of your kids are going to give their lives to Jesus. You know the number one reason why they're going to do it? It's going to be because of you. It's going to be because of your example. They're going to see something in you and they say, I want to be like my dad. I want to be like my mom. I want to have a close relationship with God like they have. Now, that will happen most of the time, and eventually they'll develop their own faith, right? That's what happened with my kids. They saw the faith of me and Christy. They wanted Jesus in their life, and then as they got older, they began to develop their own faith. They began to spend time alone with the Lord, but we were the ones that were contagious. We were the catalyst that started it all off, and it was all because we prayed over them over and over and over again. Now, there are times you can live a godly life, and your kids won't follow in your footsteps. They won't want anything to do with it. You stay consistent. You keep praying for them. You keep loving Jesus. You keep serving. You keep leveraging your life. Let me tell you something. The least your kids won't be able to say you were a hypocrite. They'll be able to look at you and say, you know what? You believe it. And I appreciate the fact that you believe it. And I believe over time, I believe over time, those children will come back to their senses and they'll come to the Lord because of your consistent example. But I also believe the opposite is true too. Kids can spot a phony a mile away, can't they? They, 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 they see us coming to church once every four to six weeks. That's the average that a person comes to this church. You knew that, right? Just once every four to six weeks. How do we know that? We know that from your kids' attendance when you drop them off. So other things are more important. What do you think that says to your child? What do you think it says to your child when, when you come to church and you, you say you love Jesus, but you don't do it in your actions, you don't do it in your words? In fact, if we put cameras up in your family compared to that of a family who doesn't have anything to do with God, there wouldn't be any difference between the two. What does it say to your children when you never pray for them? I mean, never. And that the only time that you pray is maybe at the meal. And then you say the same thing over and over again. What does that say to your kids about a dynamic relationship with Christ? What does it say to them when you go out to eat after church service and the food is served and you just rub-a-dub-dub, let's eat the grub. And no one stops and no one prays because everybody's too embarrassed to do so. What does it say to your child when you're too embarrassed to thank him for the blessing of providing that meal for your family in a public place? And what does it say to your kids when you say, let's all bow our heads and let's close our eyes and let's thank God for his provision. What does that also say? Friends, let me tell you something. We have an epidemic going on in our country today. You know what the epidemic is? This generation of kids that's growing up right now between the ages of 15 and 25, 26, have left the church more than any other generation before. They've said no to this. And why did they say no to it? The number one reason, the faith of their mom and dad. They looked at the faith of their mom and their dad, and they said, this is a joke. 
And if it's a joke to them, I don't want anything to do with it as well. If they don't take it seriously, then why should I take it seriously? Well, you can turn the tide. Your family doesn't have to be a part of that statistic. You can make prayer the centerpiece, right? You make Jesus the centerpiece of your home. Now, there's all kinds of prayers that people pray over their children. I'm going to list some of them. I think these are good prayers, but I think there's another level to praying for our children as well. We'll get to that in just a second. Here's typical prayers uh, parents pray for their kids. Ready? Lord, help my kids have a good life. Okay, nothing wrong with that, because what's the alternative? Lord, help them have a cruddy life? That wouldn't be a good prayer at all, would it? Okay. How about this one? Lord, be with us tonight and help Rachel have a good attitude. Okay, that, that's a terrible prayer. You understand that, right? For two reasons. One, whenever you pray, Lord, be with us, you're ignoring the truth of Scripture that says he'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you. And it scares me that you think there's a place that you can go where God isn't. He is always with you. And if you don't acknowledge that, thank you, God, that you're here. But don't say, hey, could you, could you come down and be with us right now? We're getting ready to pray over this food right now. It'd be great. And as far as Rachel having a good attitude, hey, Rachel, fake it till you make it. You don't need to pray about that. Suck it up, buttercup, and have a good attitude, right? But that's why we pray these prayers. Lord, help Johnny make the soccer team. Okay, that's a good prayer. But Johnny, get out and practice. Okay, you're terrible. All right, let's just say for what it is. How about this one? Lord, be with Jimmy tomorrow as he takes that test. And as he walks out the door to take that test and you pray that little prayer, make sure you add this little line to it. Lord, don't give him one answer he didn't study for. How about this one? Lord, let Beth get a good paying job because I'm tired of paying all her bills. She's 30, Lord. Come on. <laughs> Nothing wrong praying that prayer, I'll tell you that right now. My kids were little. Every night we'd go in their room and we'd pray over them. We'd pray big, hairy, audacious prayers. I'd lay hands on them and I'd say, oh God, may they desire you above everything else. May they never settle for the fleeting American dream that's here today and gone tomorrow. May they live their life for an audience of one. May every fiber of their being, may every word that they speak may it come from you may they leverage their time and their talent and their treasure for you and for you alone and may you use my kids and stretch my kids to do things and be a part of things that they never even thought that they could ever be a part of God, I pray that your hand would be so upon them that they would see you do miracle after miracle after miracle, and when they get to the end of their life, they will have left this place in better shape than the way that they found it. Now, what do you think that says to my kids when I pray a prayer like that? What do you think it would say to yours? I think they would sit back and go, what just happened? I think mom, I think dad just talked to God about me. And God loves me. God has big plans for me. God has big dreams for me. And then as you rely upon the Lord in front of them and you pray over them, over their situations, over their problems, over things that are going wrong in their life, and then they see God answering their prayers, it'll fire them up. They will go after the gates of hell with a water pistol and they will put Satan on the run. Because they will see God's power and see God's might. And it all starts when a mom or a dad or both of them get on their knees and they pray for their child or they pray over their child. When's the last time you told your kids, I prayed for you. I prayed for this situation. I just think we've got to step it up, don't you think? Again, what does it say to your kids? When they never see you read the Bible? What does it say to your kids when you never get in a small group? What does it say to them about the seriousness of how you take your own spiritual growth? What does it say to your kids when you attend this place week after week, year after year, and you never, you never lift a finger to help this church be everything that God desires it to be? What does it say to them when you come once every four to six weeks? Because something's on TV or there's something else going on. Something's more important than worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. What does it say to them 
You've got to understand something. They're watching you. They're watching every move that you make. Now, I've asked Mackenzie to come out. My oldest daughter's name is Mackenzie. This is not my oldest daughter. This is Mackenzie. She's 10 years old. Can you welcome Mackenzie as she comes out right now? I've asked Mackenzie if she would read this poem and that you would listen to the words of this poem, and my prayer is it would impact your life. Mackenzie, take it away. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you hang my first painting on the refrigerator, and I wanted to paint another one. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you feed a stray cat, and I thought it was good to be kind to animals. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you make my favorite cake just for me, and I knew that little things are special things. When you thought I wasn't looking, I heard you say a prayer, and I believe there is a God I could always talk to. When you thought I wasn't looking, I felt you kiss me goodnight, and I felt loved. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw tears come from your eyes, and I learned that sometimes things hurt, but it's all right to cry. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw that you cared, and I wanted to be everything I could be. When you thought I wasn't looking, I looked, and I wanted to say thanks for all the things I saw when you thought I wasn't looking. Great job, Mackenzie. Those little sinners are watching you. <laughs> love them with an unconditional love. Tell them over and over again. Believe in them. Tell them you're proud of them. Pray for them. I'd give anything to see another show. But now my kids are in their 20s and that would be weird. It goes by so fast that it's gone. So seize this day and be the person, be the parent that you always wanted to be. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to be kind, to be encouraging, to lift people up. That's what you've done for us. You believe in us even when we blow it. You love us no matter what. And you tell us in your word that even right now you're praying for us. So Lord, I pray that we would give those gifts to our children. In fact, I pray we'd give those gifts to every relationship that we have. Use us, Lord, to build people up. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have any questions about today's message, or if you're interested in talking to someone about your faith, we'd love to talk with you. Give us a call or text us at 505-922-9200. We have a team of people who are looking forward to talking with you. Summer is on its way, and with summer comes all the fun summer activities. Get ready for X Camp 2023 Extreme Reactions for your kindergarten through fifth graders. This year, they'll have a blast as they learn how to handle their emotions in a godly way through this three-day summer camp, July 11th through the 13th. Registration is open and spots fill up fast, so sign your kids up for X Camp 2023 Extreme Reactions today. Right after X Camp is our biggest student event all year, Remix Rally. Check this out.
Registration for Rally is open now. Go to sagebrush.church slash rally and register your middle and high school students for this jam-packed event. Don't miss out on Remix Rally 2023. You can find all this information and more on our Sagebrush app. Download it today to stay up to date on everything going on here at Sagebrush. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube for weekly content. We'll see you next time as we continue our series, Bride and Gloom. Have a great day!